Hey everybody, welcome to uh, another episode of The Rapcast. This one, a very special episode where myself and Louis Atzman, editor-in-chief of Raptors Republic, come together to deliberate on the Fred Van Vliet situation. He's talked about it to media. He's talked about it to JJ Redick. Many reporters have reported things. There's contract stuff. There's level of play stuff. There's interactions with teammates, organization, whatever. There's a bunch of stuff buzzing around about Fred Van Vliet and Louis Atzman of Raptors Republic, of 538, of a million other places, because he's such a prolific, fantastic writer, is here to talk about it with me. Louis, we haven't podcasted in a long time. Many people have said, and I believe it's only two, that we are the, what, Frazier and Niles? Is that what it is when we talk about it? I, I hear that's a good thing. I hope people like this episode. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, if I had a nickel every time, it, it wouldn't be a lot, but it's funny that it's happened twice. Yeah. I wonder it's why ha- we elicit it has, that response. It's happened twice? Yes. Oh, wow. Maybe All it's right. the same person. Maybe it. I'm not keeping track, but I've seen it twice, phrased differently. I'm doing great, though. I always, honestly, I uh, I don't like talking ball. I come on these podcasts just because your intro makes me feel so good about myself. It's I'm willing to suffer through the podcast just because, you know, if I'm ever feeling down or low, I just come on this pod, and the first 30 seconds are going to boost my spirits so much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can I also say, I think I've dropped the ball in that respect. I think that my introductions for people are not as enthused as uh, or enthusiastic as they used to be so i think you got a you got a good one to be honest i've I've lost something of myself maybe that wow that you got big distance. time no i don't think that's where you time. came from no i think it's just do you like even depression. tell people to have a blessed day anymore do you say have a mediocre day suckers no i, I i've gone non-denominational as you as you <laughs> understand it i want to i want to cast the widest net possible just like Fred Van Vliet, he wants to cast the widest net possible. Um, I'll, I'll start us off by saying that I was just at the Portland Trailblazers game that the Raptors won. Fred was asked a couple questions. He was part of the media availability. And then what he did was like, okay, are y'all done? Then he took the mic and he went on to talk about his contract situation. It had been reported that he turned down the extension. What Fred's response to that was, that he, Fred Van Vliet, and the organization on the two-year anniversary of his contract, as per CBA rules, started discussing the extension. He said both parties said that they were going to leave it till the offseason. Now, this meshes quite well with what Fred said prior to the season regarding his contract and how if the team does well, he'll be looked after. He wants to be a winning player. Those things vibe well. Anything else, I don't know if I could really speculate. I'm not uh, sourced out the wazoo, as it were. And so he, what he said was that that is where he's left it at. He will no longer talk about his contract situation for the rest of the season and that he has a player option and he's on the books for next year. That's where he left it. Uh, for the contract stuff, uh, what are your thoughts, Lewis? Yeah, I mean... Like you, uh, not sourced out to Wasu. In fact, unlike you, uh, sourceless. Um, so, you know, I, I try not to speculate about anything like this. Um, you know, similar to the effort conversation, it is true um, that guys will change their play for contracts. Um, I have no way of knowing if that's the case in any way. Um, so, you know, uh, I don't think it's, it's super pertinent for us unless we have any information. Okay. So let's talk about the the level of play then, and because that trade we have market. information, we do have information. First thing I want to talk about is because you got, uh, let's say, it's it's low yield. It's not the highest stakes, but you you've been aggregated somewhat um, because you had the numbers to, I guess, go against what Fred had said on the JJ Reddick podcast regarding his role, his changing role that. I think he thinks or has spoken to changing more than most people think. And some people think it hasn't changed at all. Some people think it's changed somewhat. So regarding Fred's role, if I could get you to sum up your thoughts on where that sits and if you have any stats off the cuff, hit me with them, please. Yeah, so um, so I went on Second Spectrum and 
looked at every detail of Fred with the ball. And uh, as soon as we started talking about this, my dog was like, let me out immediately. <laughs> <laughs> this is unacceptable that you're having hey, a podcast. Millie. So yeah, yeah, just uh, I'm going to I'm going to keep talking. I'm going to take my mic with me over to the door. Let's see if this works. This is good. Yeah, I like this. I'll keep talking as well. But this is Millie, the big poodle going out the door with Lewis before he returns to the podcast. And now you know she's going to be back asking in in like 30 seconds. Anyway, um, so I found very little change. Um, I looked at his usage rate. I looked at um, his frequency of shot attempts, his shot attempts per minute, um, where they were coming from on the floor, the level of contests. I look at how much he was dribbling every time he touched the ball. I looked at how long he was holding the ball every time he touched it. I looked at uh, how frequently he was running pick and rolls, uh, isolating, driving, uh, I, the whole gamut. And everything was within the margin of error, right? This is all human tracked. Um, so there's a margin of error. It was all, you know, it was all down fractionally. So for example, dribbles per touch was down by like 0.1 dribble. You know, it was like 5.4 dribbles per touch to 5.3. That's It was 4.5 to 4.4 or something. Um, but, you know... The same, all the same. Um, and so I tweeted that, and a lot of people like that because Fred is um, a lightning <laughs> rod right now for conversation, which yeah. is part of why we're doing this. Not only has he drawn ire, he's also drawn this. Um, so we, we can't criticize because we're in the same strike of lightning. Uh, and then I was unhappy with that because Fred's not the type of guy to make something up. Uh, and he said his role changed, and just that... It must have changed, I figured. So I spent the rest of the day intermittently looking um, through more stats. And eventually I found and corrected myself. No one was criticizing me, just unprompted. I corrected myself. I apologized. I didn't apologize, but I said, you know, I actually think I was wrong in some, some regard. The only thing I found when playing alongside Toronto's other, you know, stars or in a star role guys, Gary Trent Jr., OG Ananobi, Pascal Siakam, Scotty Barnes, his usage rate is down by by a very wide margin from about 19 point something percent to 13.5 percent, which is 13.5 is low, low. That was like rookie OG Ananobi. Like you're just not yep. finishing possessions. And that's what he was saying. You know, if you go back to the JJ Redick pod, he said, you know, to open games, he's not getting the touches to get in rhythm. And that is is the case because he opens games alongside these other stars usage rates really low as much as he um might be maybe overemphasizing the change in role it wasn't made up in there there is change particularly alongside toronto's best players i'll be just back in a moment yeah and so i think that is kind of what it, it does make sense that that was what he was talking about it does make sense that that's how he would address it and i also do think it's fair to look at what he's saying under a magnifying glass and to kind of compare because that type of change in role is true, but the way he's talked about his change in role is as if it's this sweeping, massive change. He discusses it in that manner. And while I think that there has been changes in how he operates next to some of the guys with bigger roles who are trying to stretch their legs this season, but also as far as the rhythm with which he gets his shots, the time of the games with which he gets his shots, that's true. Um, I still don't think it's as he portrays it. I also don't think it's as mostly everybody portrayed it as like, LOL, you liar, which isn't yeah. what you did, by the way. But that's kind of the response he was hit with. And, you know, I, I talked about this as well on Twitter, and I mentioned that the role has changed somewhat, and this is kind of where we stand. In that role, though, and this was probably the interesting, the most interesting aspect of the J.J. Redick thing is that you have to think that Fred is protecting his value on the open market, or at least that's what I would expect from the conversation he's been, or the conversations he's been having all year, and especially with J.J. Redick bringing up the most important question, because J.J. Redick, prior to that podcast, would have looked at Fred's shooting numbers, referenced them against his past, saw how they were 
post All Star break last season, where he was a twenty nine percent catch and shoot shooter. This season, where he's hanging around like thirty three percent, right? And he says, "I've been a shooter. I know what compensation feels like and looks like, and how we can miss it sometimes coming off screens, running off pin downs, all this kind of stuff." He says, "How much has that affected you?" And Fred says, "Probably a lot." Then mentions what he's supposed to say, the way that the market works. And then goes on to mention role, how that changed, and how tough it's been for him to adjust. I think when it comes to the catch and shoot stuff, I would err on the side of saying there's a physical change rather than a role change. And that's what makes this really tough. Big time. Um, you made a really good point. He has played this role before. Yes. He has not been a starting point guard his entire career with the Raptors. He's not even been a point guard or a starter. He he was a shooting guard off the bench, you know, when he, when he broke into the rotation. Um, so a lot of it, I think, like you say, is, is positioning, um, off the court, uh, information politics as it were, which yes. is why I understand you bringing up the contract information, uh, because it's pertinent. Uh, not that I don't want to not discuss it because I don't think it matters. I want to not discuss it because I don't have anything to add. Um, so, so I'm glad you mentioned that you said a physical, uh, a physical change. Now I want to get it really deep into his play, into his shooting. We we've only discussed the narrative. We're setting the stage. What do you mean by a physical change? I, I mean it in the same way that JJ Redick meant it and the way that anybody discussing a shooter or anybody's well-being would understand this stuff the same way Pascal coming off of his torn labrum, right? You worry, and especially in the lower half for a guy who has a low load like Fred when he shoots, also understanding that what Nick Nurse told us at practice was that the alignment on Fred's shooting changed. He misses left to right now, and that hasn't historically been the case for him. These are things that seem to lend to the idea that Fred is compensating for injuries or has been in the past and has created an uneven load in his shot, an uneven finish. Somewhere in his body, something has gone on that changed the foundation of his jumper, and he's been fighting to correct that. And he still misses left to right a lot more often than he used to. He used to be a, a front or a short and long misser, but now he can miss in every single quadrant, right? And I think... As Nick Nurse said, that is uncommon for a shooter to have happen. The sheer amount of injuries he's had to deal with, the staggering drop-off of the numbers over, you know, a non-inconsequential number of games. Like, this is this is 65, 70 games of this, right, where he's a 31% catch-and-shoot shooter, basically like a, a 10, 12% drop-off from what we expect in his career. These things can't really be accounted for within role because last year he wasn't talking about role. He was talking about getting healthy. This year he's talking about role prior to the contract. He wants to make as much money as possible as is his right. That is where I'm sitting at with his shooting. And I'm sure he can get to a place where he gets it back and everything works great. But the truth of the matter is that something has gone on with Fred VanVleet's body that has created a response that he's had to deal with and struggle through. There's a lot of indications I use to judge Fred's health. We've been covering this guy for a long time, many, many seasons, and we've been covering his injuries for many seasons. Uh, his drives, whether he gets to the rim, is, is big for how healthy he is. Um, his engagement on the defensive level, his, the arc on his jumper. I mean, sometimes when he's really feeling it, his, his shots go out of frame on the television. That's like a pretty good indication it's going in. Although I haven't tracked it because that would be – difficult but if (laughs) it goes out of frame it's like a over half 50 chance he just he drills those so you know there's a lot and recently even before and after the back spasms a lot of those triggers for health were there he's driving his defense is is man it's engaged he's in there he's not getting blown by he's just bullying people off ball he's you know he's he's in the gaps The arc is back on his jumper tonight. He went four for nine, I think, from deep. Uh, A lot of stuff looks like he's healthy. But exactly as you say, 
when you're unhealthy, you can change things that don't change back when you get healthy. And I think I wanted to add, you know, in past pods you've brought up his catch and shoot versus, versus pull up numbers because his pull up numbers are about the same. Static. And there's movement in there, right? The 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 mm-hmm. definition is your body is moving into the shot, whereas catch and shoot you're stationary. And so I actually w- wanted to dive into another type of breakdown that's not publicly accessible which is relocation threes. It counts under catch and shoot, but you're still moving into it because you are relocating into the three. And his relocation threes have actually been his true superpower. Like, yes, catch and shoot threes, yes, but relocation of catch and shoot have been even above. It's like, he's such a ridiculous cutter and screener and mover off ball, he lifts, he drops. He's so phenomenal. And we saw a lot of that tonight. And he can chain that into drives, pump fakes, relocations, catch, drive, relocation, catch. It's just he is a whirlwind, a tornado of offensive activity. And, and, you know, statistically, that relocation three has been absolutely phenomenal. He shot uh, his effective field goal or his uh, his field goal percentage was almost 50 percent on relocation threes in 1920. He's had multiple years over 40 percent. Uh, everything else really being high 30s. And this year, high 30s. Among catch and shoot threes, relocation threes have not dipped at all. They're still elite. And those are the catch and shoot threes with movement still into them, just like the pull-ups. And so what if we're if we're looking at motion um, being the thing that gets him back to his usual jumper mechanics, then we're really pinning down. It is the totally stationary. I'm not yep. moving catch launch where he was phenomenal. That though is what has changed. That is what has fallen off. So there is an interesting aspect of mid range shooters, shooters who have, I guess, less dependable mechanics being much better when they create their own rhythm yeah. from the pull up from relocation. And, and, and it's not just Demar. It's a lot of players over the history of the NBA and when your mechanics aren't Michael quiet, Trump. aren't sound, right? Kobe Bryant, sure, as well. These guys, they get into a space where it's relying on that skill and just getting to a spot and you feel the rhythm of your body and then you go. Fred is a guy who has had extremely sound mechanics for such a long time. And I think this is again back to the body. I think that it's changed somewhat. Couldn't say exactly where, but you know, this the stats correlate. As with the the movement shooting, you know, it's kind of like I have nerve damage in my hand, right? Significant amount of nerve damage in my hand. I don't have a feeling in, uh, is, is your ring finger your left or right hand? I believe they're both ring fingers. Oh, okay. Well, on my left hand, I don't have feeling in this finger. It doesn't wrinkle when I go in water. It's, I broke my hand. I have no feeling in it. It completely changed the way that I shoot the basketball because I can't anchor the ball on this finger. When I have a quiet, discreet free throw, that or a, or a catch and shoot jumper, that is oftentimes the hardest shot for me personally because everything quiets down and I focus on the hand. But when I'm doing a pull up and I can kind of get the rest of my body into the motion that I used to go into, then this follows through this repeats the motion that it did prior to the injury. Like it's the muscle memory of the whole holistic thing. But when it quiets down, I feel that and I address that. And I have to think, well, I don't have to, I do think that Fred is going through something like that with his catch and shoot yeah. stuff. Outside of that. And, and so there's a couple of components to this. Um, his catch and shoot jumper is the most important part of his game. Yes. Um, it is what makes him a, an elite all-star level player who is matches anybody, right? Because alongside Pascal Siakam, he can run pick and roll, he can create, he can get in transition, he can defend, he can rebound. He does all this stuff, which is really good. But if he's not hitting that catch and shoot jumper, then there's a little bit of, uh, of, of friction in the, in the fit because they both want the ball in their hands. And I just wrote that piece about all four of Toronto stars right now, or, you know, star role players within the role of a star. There we go. Um, Those four guys all have had their off ball skills depreciate to some extent this year for varying reasons. Yes. 
And Fred is supposed to be the guy, kind of like Kyle, who just no matter what is giving you elite production because when he gets off the ball, that catch and shoot jumper is the the best way you can end a possession in the NBA. It was for half a season last year, right? When when you're shooting 44% on a catch and shoot three, that's a Steph three. That's a Giannis in in the paint. That's a Jose Calderon free throw. Well, it's not quite that good. But like that is, you know, if if you're looking at how do I want a possession? What do I want out of an offense? How do you want it to end? That is the best way in basketball. And when he's not doing that, then all the other stuff is great, is really, really good, but it's not as valuable. And I think a lot of people have become accustomed to Fred giving enormous star level yes. impact. And it's just not star level without that. Although, and I do want to, you know, it's really important to me that we do mention really good play. Like, so good, regardless. Not a star, but so good. I I maybe would quibble with so good. Let's quibble. I understand. Yeah, I would quibble with so good. But I do want to say that is the most important point to make with the Raptors struggling as much as they have. It was why... I asked Fred what I did on media day about more catch and shoot threes and how yeah. unbelievably good he was and why everybody collectively assumed that Fred was handcrafted as a person to slide down the hierarchy yeah. of Scotty handling the ball, OG handling the ball, Pascal handling the ball, because the possession can still end in his hands and what could possibly be better than that. But if the catch and shoot jumper isn't there, you lose not only that aspect of Fred's game, making him disgruntled, making him upset with results, but you lose that aspect of the offense that there's no punch when you get side top side action from Pascal, Scotty, or OG. And, and OG also falls into that a little bit as well with the with the catch and shoot stuff too. Losing that aspect of their offense and also all the misses wherein you know there's runouts picking up in transition, all that kind of stuff. They just, they're losing points every game. Yep. Just undeniably, they're losing points every game because of this development. And not just points, the difference between winning and losing. Like Fred yes. misses those threes against Portland, they lose the game tonight, no matter how well they play. And Fred makes those games, makes those shots he missed in a couple recent games, they win some games that they lost. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, a lot has changed for the Raptors this season. A huge amount. But Fred's catch-and-shoot shooting, you know, has been the thing that if it's on this end of the spectrum or that end, the winning or losing is in the middle. And there's other things that, you know, let's say Precious is still the world leader he was last year on both ends. Or OG shooting is where it was. Or, you know... um, OG's driving or Scotty's, you know, better. Then maybe the, sh- the catch and shoot shooting is up here. And okay, the winning and losing is down here. If he makes or misses, they're still winning. But in combination with all the other stuff, this has been the hinge. And that's why he's such a lightning rod, among other reasons. But, you know, people see, oh, you went 0 for 2 on uncontested triples in a two-point loss. And those misses were in the last minute of the game. That hurts, man. And it's so visible. That that's when you get, you know, that's when you get fans wishing ill on reporters for saying that this guy is playing well. <laughs> like it, it the, the, well, so, wait, let's, let's say, let's say more, more importantly, wishing ill on Fred, like on mass. Yo, I said this to you in the DMs. I'll say this here. Fred has benefits. The man can afford a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a freelancer here. I do not have benefits. <laughs> He doesn't need to be online. He doesn't need to be on Twitter for his job. I don't. I don't like people attacking Fred in tw- on Twitter. That's ridiculous. You know, people DMing or, or tweeting at a player, outrageous, irresponsible, juvenile behavior. A player's family way over the line. That's when you get you know players confronting fans, and I think yeah. rightfully so. Um, but I also don't like you know, fans attacking reporters for just saying a player's playing well or something like that. Well, yeah. And I I have thoughts on this. I don't like that. So I understand fans love and feel the the agency to be able to critique openly on mass, all that kind of stuff. And um, I, I do understand why that's appealing, but also, you know, it's, 
reporters have to <laughs> operate in an online space. God, I haven't had it happen to me. Very lucky not to have had Except it. for your yeah. anti-baby tweet. Yeah, right, right, right. As right. a man with but, a baby. <laughs> yes, um, Elliot, my, my apologies. Uh, my deepest, deepest, most sincere apologies. Anyway, let's let's move on. So, Fred, this maybe gives us a good idea or a, a good branch to jump over to a, a good segue to hop on over to the fan base perception why he's being tied into all of the ills of the raptors and why that's not necessarily true but a departure between you know a breakup between these two parties the raptors and fred may may be coming may be helpful for the future whatever that ends up being i i do want to talk about fred the trade market how he's perceived by the fan base currently, all that kind of stuff. So if I could get your thoughts on that. As long as we do have our quibble about how he's actually oh, let's Let's quibble. Game. Let's quibble then. So, okay, I think um, there were stretches during the year where his defense waned, um, particularly mm-hmm. his on-ball defense. Um, yes. He was giving up some blow buys that did not need to happen. Um, not the entirety of the year. And I think, you know, by and large, his defense this year has been spectacular. Um, There were parts of the season where he was um, trying to shoot himself. Is spectacular a word with like a lot of meaning to you or define, you know, I'm just saying like spectacular defense, spectacular. Uh, Okay, I I could go down to very good. You know, I would say compared to starting point guards across the league. Sure, uh, okay. His defense on the the season has been above average. Yes, okay, I'd agree with that. Which is very good. But not not what we're used to. No, no, not what we're used to. But I think, you know, based on the last four or five games worth of sample, it'll end up where he's been, man. His defense, the last three games, Milwaukee, New York, Portland, holy God, he has been a yeah. whirlwind of activity. Just he gaps so well. And like OG, he just he just teleports to where he needs to be on the rotation. So it's not even a gamble. He's just there. He strips, he, man, his tagging. I remember, I don't have the stats on hand about this. There was a stretch last year where he was the yeah. best tagger in the NBA. Because he just met everyone below the rim with his absolute meat hook hands and just stripped everyone. And, and he, he remains this enormously powerful tagger. Um, he, the, also, the last three games, he said, you know what? Our defensive rebounding is not great. I'm going to just do it myself. He's been blocking out centers. He's been doing the Kyle thing where he is just the best defensive rebounder on the floor. He finds a body. He smashes it. No matter the size differential, he gets the rebound. He pushes. I mean, based on the last three games, he has been as good as he's ever been. Um, and yes, there have been there's been waning, no doubt. I, I would say maybe forty percent of the season to this point. You know, a third to to four, you know, two fifths of the season, he's been below where we'd expect. Um, but at the top end, which is where he's been as we're recording this podcast, uh, I'm not that worried about his defense. Yeah, he's had a he's had a very nice defensive stretch. And uh, the Raptors have also, I think, gotten more emboldened this year with placing OG on um, star ball handlers. Then, yep. And I think, I don't know if I have the exact share, the statistics of it, but I think OG is being used uh, in more volume in those situations, even if it's a smaller handler than yep. Fred has been. Which, Tyrese Halliburton and Fred guarded Buddy Heald. Yeah. For example, and even, you know, th- that got switched around even more during that game for what it's worth because they put OG on Heald in the second half and because Heald was just going nuts. But Fred, I th- his off-ball defense continues to astound and amaze me. I know a lot of people were picking on him for the rotation into the paint against the Bucks. I maintain that I think he made the correct rotation because Giannis yeah, often Euro steps in. And I think the ideal rotation was for OG to rotate to the corner i don't know if this is something they planned beforehand i don't want to blame og because defensive rotations especially when you have five guys collapsing the paint are tough but looking at that from a snapshot considering how much the Raptors want to throw at Giannis, og rotating over and then if it's going to be swung up uh That's it's easier rotation. to 
it's easier for Fred to rotate yeah. up and for OG to rotate out to, and then you still get to have your cake and eat it too and throw bodies at Giannis because Fred was in a position where he could have changed uh, that possession. If Giannis did Euro step, you want to talk about meat hooks under the rim, right? But OG was behind the play no matter what, basically. And so that's why I think that would have been the best play. Regardless, we're quibbling offensively. Uh, you know, he had the Fred Gilgis Alexander run. That was obviously like four games. <laughs> yeah, really, really impressive. But on the season, I think that the Raptors are still dealing with and like many players on the roster, his inability to play make with ease. Um, the pull-up jump shot has been about as good as it's ever been, truthfully. He had, what, like a 16-game a run last season where it was 37 38%. But hanging around 33% is good enough to lead an yeah. NBA offense as a pull-up artist. And uh, the stuff in the mid-range, fine. Stuff at the rim, fine. But this is a guy who I think isn't capable of leading a healthy NBA offense. Does but nor is he asked sense? to. Yeah. In in some cases, yes. In some cases, no, right? Like, he's an all-star. He is a guy who wants more of the ball. He's a guy who has openly in the media requested that he be prioritized as such. He is a guy who wants to run. He wants to be the guy to bring the ball down the floor, set the tone for a possession, run the pick and roll, see what comes out of it, reset as he pleases, play make as he pleases. And I don't think that while we said like, hey, he wasn't lying, his role has changed. I still don't think, I still think it's correct to say that he's in the correct role currently, you know? Uh, well, I had actually... You mean in that he is being deprioritized to bolster Siakam? Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, I do agree. And in fact, I yeah. think his role should even be maybe a touch slider. Um, yes. But to me, uh, he he still gives so much. Like, yeah, without the catch-and-shoot three, the that, that top end push you over the edge, not there. Um, but... He has uh, gotten pretty good at that in-the-pocket bounce pass in the pick-and-roll. And he has lob chemistry with Coloco to the extent that the Fred Coloco um, pick-and-roll uh, grouping is actually Toronto's um, best high-volume pick-and-roll um, at, at this point. It's better than any either of Fred's partnerships with Pascal. Um, it is the, the best option they have right now. Uh, which is phenomenal, right? That's great. His lob passing has gotten better. It's still not it's still not average for a starting point guard, but it's doable. It's you know it's adequate. Uh, he his he he screens really well. You know he he has all these little things that just sort of chip in. So yeah, he's not a star level contributor on the offensive end, and and the Raptors want him to be not just want they require him to be contextually. They don't have someone to shift in and say, okay, you're not giving us this star punch to end possessions. We'll just shift those to this other guy. You know, uh, let's say Duncan Robinson's not hitting his threes for the Heat. In past seasons, they said, okay, Max Struess will just take those threes. Or, you know, this season, less so. But there's other guys they can shift to take. The Raptors don't have that. They don't have someone to give that killer punch at the end of a possession. That's contextually, it makes Fred look worse because they just don't have someone to to pick up those pieces he's dropped. No yeah. one is like an, an above average efficiency for his position. No one. That's crazy. And so, you know, I think it all adds up to a really good, solid player, if not the star mm -hmm. the Raptors need. To the extent that, you know, and I know you hate, you hate stats, especially catch-all stats. And I think there's a lot to that, but we've talked about enough film that I can... I, I love in my right. stats. No, I hate catch-all stats. stats. I love stats. You hate stats I, as you should. To Fred's EPM, and I know catch-all stats are bad, but we've talked about enough that I think I can mention this, as, you know, as just one point of many. His EPM is, is right now uh, directly in between Jalen Brown and Chris Paul. Like, 92nd percentile in the league. Now, I think that way overstates his value. I think Fred is actually, um, for a lot of reasons, particularly his deflections, his defensive rebounding as a guard, um, and his on-offs because there's not a great 
backup guard. Catch all stats love him more than they should, and they overstate his value. But but the, I think he has been a very productive player despite his down components, and uh, which which sucks for me because he's not what they need him to be. He's still quite good, and that level of nuance is is almost impossible to have in the conversation around the um, our house is on fire conversation. Right uh, for the Raptors. So this brings up the. For most people, the most interesting aspect is that, and I'm sure you've you'd agree that the yeah, I'm sure you'd agree that the way uh, you listen to the podcast that myself, Trey, and S did, I think yes. that Fred was discussed fairly there. But you also, mm-hmm. as you said, Fred is not the player that the Raptors need him to be. Although he used to be that guy, he yeah. isn't currently. You are in a position where you could recoup assets, etc for Fred, because if this team, as we said, was built contextually to over rely on Fred, which it was, Fred is not holding back Vision 6-9 in the slightest. I think that's an absurdity. I don't agree with that at all. Vision 6-9 has been so reliant on their six foot or sub six foot guard because he has guard skills and because he's the little things king. He's having a worse season though, and that means that this team has looked significantly worse, despite other players having better seasons. They've lost so much from him that you it does make you look at this team and say, if this team can't do it without Fred at this level, what does this team do as a unit? Do you look to move Fred and try and build accordingly? Because Fred probably, given what we know about, he's even said it in press conferences, right? At my size, it's hard to do what I do. Yep. And it's like he takes a beating. Do you try and move him on to give him a run with another team where they like he, the little things, Kings things that he does is extremely valuable to them and not something they've had before and learned to ignore or became overly reliant on? It's just all surplus, surplus, surplus. Yeah. Do you do that instead of maybe going into the offseason? Maybe he takes his player option. Maybe you sign him to something, maybe extension, whatever it ends up being, right? Do you move on from Fred Van Vliet this season? Is that is that in your mind at all? It is in my mind, um, which sucks because um, as a journalist, uh, I came up with Fred. Um, you know, you he... invented the guy. No, no, my, I can't. Uh, I see. I can't. My my beginning in the league coincided by total fluke with his beginning in the league. The largest, most notable piece of his great defense, like the first to do it, was yours. Fred was, it was before he was in the finals, it was before he had that reputation. You were paying attention to the little things king on the defensive end, and that was one of the biggest pieces you had written to that point. Yeah, and I mean, even beyond that, he... uh is a guy that uh, not a lot of people want to talk to media. Not a lot of people have interest in that. And and Fred does. And, you know, for example, I wrote a piece about two for ones with the Raptors. Um, and I was, I talked to Fred, this is back when we, I, we were in the locker room, talked to Fred about, you know, how Pascal was the most efficient two for one guy on the Raptors better than Fred or Kyle. He said, Oh, that's pretty interesting. And then Pascal closed the first, second, and third quarter with two for ones that game. It's like, oh, you know, I, you know, Fred had that conversation. Uh, you wonder, a- and things like that really stick with you as a writer. You're talking to someone. You're you're interacting. Did I change what happened on the floor? Of course not. That's ridiculous. But it, it you know, those memories are something that attach you to a guy. Objectivity is a ridiculous notion. We're getting away from it, right? And so, of course, I'm a t- I'm drawn to Fred as a writer. Um, and so it sucks to recognize that, you know, he and the Raptors might be in places uh, that are diverging. Um, but yeah, you know, that's reality. Um, being subjective doesn't put blinders on your eyes. Now, I would um, question whether it would help the Raptors to actually move on from Fred. Because as we said, if you, okay, he's not hitting his catch and shoot threes or wasn't until this Portland game. Uh, so who are you going to move them to? Turns out you just don't have that guy on the roster. 
like maybe Gary Trent's taking 15 threes rather than nine. I don't think that's a feasible way to, to adapt an offense, right? Yeah. Um, there's counters for that as a defense. And Scotty Barnes getting lots of touches. Like this guy is not standing in the way of Scotty's development in the same way that Pascal was not standing in the way of Scotty's development last year. And so I'm not sure the Raptors need to move on from Fred by virtue of what's happening on the court. I think, and, and you in your podcast with Trey, Trey and S were pretty astute with this, the three of you, I mean, in that, you know, I think you guys agreed moving on from, from Fred hurts you in the short term. It makes you um, much worse. And, yeah. and anybody who tries to argue otherwise, um, I guess if we get to see it, I would be shocked to see if you are correct, um, truthfully. But um, I just, I don't see a, an avenue outside of like random phenomena uh, across the earth to create like these incredible types of development in, in the blink of an eye because Fred is now gone and that vacuum yeah. is not filled by, you know, space. It's filled with bursting undeniable stardom. But we saw space when like these guys get injured, right? Fred gets injured. Pascal gets injured. We've seen the players on the roster with space, with carte blanche at times, and it isn't just bursting unbelievable stardom, not guaranteed. It is the inconsistencies, the um, ups and downs of players trying to reach stardom, like Scotty Barnes, for example, who I'm sure will get there. I'm fairly yeah. certain this guy will end up a star, but that doesn't mean that all of, all the possessions from Fred go to him and suddenly the Raptors, they work perfectly. It's like the dream of what this team is supposed to be. And now Scotty will be able to replicate everything that, you know, you came up in your mind that he's able to do and he'll be able to do it against every NBA defense. It's just that isn't what happens. NBA teams need floors. A small tangent. This sure. idea of pitting Scotty and Fred against each other is so yeah. silly. They they just they're both having um, different routes to evolution as players than I think fans expected from them. Uh, I think they are both having unequivocally very productive seasons, if not the seasons that maybe they wanted for themselves or fan wanted fans front wanted from themselves. Still quite good in a lot of different ways, and uh, they don't take away from one another. Uh, they quite help each other when they play beside each other. They, there's plenty of touches for both of them. Uh, it's unfortunate that complimenting one seems to be criticizing the other because it's not that way. Uh, they both deserve criticism for small components of the game. Certainly not silly things like Fred tanking the locker room. That's outrageous. Or or Scotty not putting in work. That's, also, that's equally outrageous. You know, yeah. there's fair criticisms to be made, but by and large, they're completely unconnected criticisms. Sorry, just had to really pigeonhole yep. that. But my question to you then, if it doesn't help them in the short term, and I have an answer for this as well, and I imagine we agree, why do you want, why do the Raptors consider moving off of Fred? Health. If health wasn't a question, I wouldn't be discussing this. If the Raptors were, and, you know, let's say they have just as bad a run Fred is shooting the three well. And let's say, as we said, it creates the margin of error. They win more games if he shoots it better. He even said that in his interview with JJ Redick, right? How some games have come down to him hitting shots and some games have come down to him missing shots. And that's, you know, that's astute. And, you know, people, because Fred has struggled, because the team is struggling and because Fred is more willing and cogent with the media uh, I guess it provides an opportunity for people to use his quotes and provide evidence of selfishness or provide evidence of self-aggrandizing, all this kind of stuff. I don't think that's necessarily true on his behalf. But these guys, when it comes to Fred, you worry about health and you worry about signing a contract where Fred never really gets that catch-and-shoot shooting back. And the catch-and-shoot shooting as we as we stated many times is paramount to his success holy smokes brody um <laughs> paramount to his success and paramount to what the raptors want to achieve yep. these are all very big deals and if that is truly evaporated from his game which who knows at this point but it's about a month until the raptors get to say yes or no right 
That's right. Um, Health yeah. in combination with the contract. Yes. If it's just Fred as a guy under team control and you're not worried about how he ages, if you're not worried about anything like that, then he is, then you keep him. Yes, because then it could be sign and trade. Then it could be, um, you know, worst case scenario. Then it could be somebody, I guess, um, uh, signing a, a team friendly contract, a contract that's bet on himself, all that kind of stuff. That's very important. But the biggest aspect of it is that you worry about signing a guy who's not going to provide heaps and heaps of value to your team as the years go on. And also the Raptors currently have a top 15 player in Pascal Siakam. They have a young star in Scotty Barnes, and they have a very top of the line role player, if not pseudo star of sorts because of his defense mixed with his offense, OG Ananobi. You just have to try and maximize these players. And Fred, if his health continues to deteriorate, will not be in a position to do that, even more so than what we've discussed him doing so far this year. Cyclops knew Kung Fu. That man <laughs> was really good at fighting. You know you know what else he could do is shoot lasers out of his eyes. If the X-Men had a, had a salary cap, and Cyclops stopped being able to shoot lasers out of his eyes. You're not, you don't want to sign a guy just for his Kung Fu, right? And the Raptors, if Fred's lost his laser blasting three point shooting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if he's lost, then it. it's, then, you know, that hurts. That hurts, right? So I think a lot of the, this other, the, the other parts of this conversation is, we're discussing a lot of what's changed about Fred um, with without discussing the context of the Raptors have so much going wrong all at the same time. And I really do think uh, that... You mean if, it's not all Fred? <laughs> that's right. I, it's not. <laughs> but if a couple other things have had not gone wrong, you know, let's say Precious t- t- took a step sure. forward and at the same time let's say Scotty Barnes three pointer remained where it was in the beginning of the season, you know, 36, 37% and he trusted it. If those two things had happened, maybe you you get a little healthy too. Would we even be talking about Fred? Cause the end of the year last year, Fred was missing threes. Yeah. Catch and shoot threes, but they won like every game. They were just killer to end last season. And some people like, I I know you and I were both talking about threats, Fred's three point shot, but by and large, there wasn't this conversation about Fred being this negative. And I do wonder if um, if the team fixes some of the other issues, if Fred just looks fixed, whether or not his laser blasting vision comes back. This is also because Fred's struggles were discussed not during the back end of the regular season. His health was discussed, but he yeah. was not made to be the reason for the Raptors' struggles. That happened in the playoffs when the Raptors were losing. That wasn't happening at the start of the year when Fred still wasn't fully himself or the the self that we knew as an all-star, etc. Nobody cared because the Raptors were winning. This also happened to Pascal Siakam, right? Yep. Where the Ra- he comes back, he's finally healthy after however many months off. The Raptors go on a terrible defensive streak and suddenly Pascal Siakam, because of coincidence, is pinned as the guy who is the reason for a struggling defense. He's also pinned as the guy who he's keeping Scotty from being his best self. And all of this is ridiculous. And Pascal, at that point in time, even more so because he actually wasn't struggling. He was playing really well and he still got pinned on that Which we both discussed. Yes, yes. Fred is struggling but he still shouldn't be the poster boy for the Raptors' failures. Fred, contextually, is very important to the Raptors. That doesn't mean that he is responsible for uplifting all the things that he typically does. He goes out there, he busts his ass, he plays the to the best of his ability, right? And the Raptors are overly reliant on him. They struggle because of that. But the onus still has to be on other players to uphold their end of the bargain. It has to be the team-wide defense, which has faltered and failed way more so than last year. It is the lack of vision, let's say, 
from the front office over the past couple of years to sign players who carry value from year to year. Who like your video today. Dra- right. Draft picks that carry value year to year. Using a first round pick on Malachi Flynn and there's just no way he signs a second contract with the Raptors. Missed opportunity. Dewan Hernandez, David Johnson, Jalen, you know, like when it comes to these guys, you're not getting any value. And the Raptors used to get value. Justin Champagny, an undrafted free agent, we wondered what would happen. What would happen with him? Is it is it the Fred Van Vliet story? No, of course it's not Fred Van Vliet story. But could he be one of the many players who comes undrafted and gives you some oomph off the bench and develops a career? Maybe he still does, but it's not with the Raptors, and they're not getting any value from that. Utah, O'Shea, trades, all this kind of stuff. There's just not value carrying over from year to year, except for Fred Van Vliet, Pascal Siakam, yeah. Gary Trent Jr., OG Ananobi, and now Scotty Barnes, right? And and Chris Boucher and Pre- Precious yeah. Achua will continue to do so, you'd assume. But it's it's a team-wide failure. And Fred is so important and so integral that suddenly it looks like it's him. But you have to do your due diligence to see what else is missing here. And what else is missing is is a lot. Like it, it's it's a organizational loss at, at many different points. That all makes Fred look worse. Yeah. By virtue of his incredible foundational significance to this team. If you just put Monty Morris on this team, DeLon Wright, just just a, a really, you know, a high-end backup guard, as Kyle had in Fred for, for multiple years, that would make Fred look so much better, man. Like, it's so important to have options when things go wrong. Versatility. You know, we all talk about versatility. You know who maybe the least versatile team is in the NBA? The Raptors. That's right. They have five guys that they can ask to do stuff. And, you know, they don't all have huge versatility of their own. Like Fred's getting better as a pick and roll player, very versatile off ball. But you can't just give him the ball and say, go get a bucket in isolation. And that's why a lot of late game situations don't look great. He's not a point guard you get a mismatch on and say, go get a bucket in the post. Like they just aren't versatile. And if Fred was able to say, you know what? I'm not hitting catch and shoot threes. Maybe run me alongside another point guard. Wow, the Raptors would look a lot better in those moments. And so a lot of the failure of Fred's um, top end, you know, punch is the failure on on the Raptors brass to replace that top end punch. And yeah. so yeah, it's possible the Raptors move on from him, but equally likely the Raptors say maybe let's do something to make the team need him less. Well, that's that's the other aspect of it is that if the team in concert with Fred feels good about and I don't know how this works with the heavy minutes, with what he's being currently asked to do with the team's really bad record. What does that mean for next year? Do they believe that Fred comes back next year? Do they maybe and truthfully shut him down early and say, you are we still see a very very impactful player but we need to see you healthy because we need those found every foundational aspect of your game to return with us next year when we try this thing again this is the damian lillard portland trailblazers thing who they just played tonight is the trailblazers retooled in one year they had this terrible year and cj mccollum went and the the blazers said we're going to build a different team around Dame, and it won't include CJ, even though CJ was foundational. And the Raptors, they have to decide if Fred's value on the trade market, what he returns, is worth more to them than if they believe he's coming back healthy next year. And if they don't believe that, then I think the answer is pretty easy. And yeah, yeah just to say once again, Fred is not having the year he should be, but the Raptors organization has not built the team that they should have. Okay, Seems so fair. this is something I wanted to ask you, and I think now is the time to ask. We've we've talked about Fred's struggles and successes, um, the conversation around him and the context of the team around that. A successful team built um, around this Fred Van Fleet, what does that look like? Built around him? 
just a, a successful team, Raptors team with Fred Van Vliet on it. What does that look like? It probably it looks like it has marginal improvements from OG Ananobi, from Scotty Barnes, um, Pascal Siakam maintaining this level, Precious Achua figuring out his offense to the point that he can keep his defense on the floor. It is continued winning minutes from those interesting long lineups that the Raptors like to put out there, the Funk Fest Quartets or Cinco de Mayo, whatever you want to call it. They they have to continue to do those things, but they also have to hit on Otto Porter Jr. instead of having a guy who's absolutely completely injured. They have to have a backup point guard that can defend the pick and roll, at least with a modicum of the... I guess, level that they expect from Fred. They have to have a guy who can run a pick and roll in a pinch and spray to the weak side corner, hit a pull-up jumper, hit the roller, and if they go under, hit a three-point shot and also be a guy who, if the ball swings to him, isn't like going to knock the lights out or anything, but is going to hit catch-and-shoot threes. They need that stuff to happen, and they need, in my estimation, a big. Precious Achua, whether... Because this the Vision 6-9 thing, right? Precious is what makes that viable on defense because Pascal, as much as great as he is defensively, he just can't. Pascal, OG, yeah. Scotty, these guys cannot go up against centers game in and game out and just kill themselves trying to maintain that. Precious is the best opportunity the Raptors have to bring like the grit and tenacity to actually go up against those guys like turn them away at the bucket in rotation, whoever's driving, contest them on the catch in the paint, beat them on the glass when it's a very contested board, it's up in the air, and it's not only getting vertical vertical to grab it, but it's all the like boxing you know, positioning beforehand. They just need so much more on this roster that they don't currently have. And it is tied, once again, to that versatility. Why is this team... Why does it seem like they play so many games that they can't get out the get, can't get out from under the rock? Because yeah. other teams' game plans ostracize the Raptors' current construction. And why is it that once games are out of hand and the game plans kind of break apart and get loose, that the Raptors are able to take advantage of their of their presses and and their length on defense and that kind of stuff? It's because the other team loses their their drive to continue to ostracize what the Raptors do well. And when teams are engaged. You know, sometimes the Raptors can get the better of teams. They did against Portland tonight, and that was really well done against the likes of Simons and, and Dame and Nurkic. But they can't do this game in and game out. That much, I think, is clear. And um, Fred doesn't necessarily solve that, but he does provide scoring punch defense, especially off-ball guard defense, which is underrated in the NBA, and all that kind of stuff. That is very important, but the Raptors have to decide if they will be able to maximize Fred and the other players at this point in time or over the next couple of years, which so is So you described a lot. I yeah. think a- another thing I think right now, the current iteration of Fred is probably taking, you know, right now uh, he is taking 16 shots a game. The The best version of Fred, you know, a very successful team with this Fred on it, probably 10 to 12, right? F- fewer shots. Um, and he says, uh, I'm at my best with the ball in my hands. I think the Raptors probably need to say, we're at the our best without you at your best. Yeah. But so which goes into all the other stuff you said, and that's how they can be at their best without Fred at his best. So... That's a it ton just, of it, stuff. It, it just and works so much better. It just works so much better if Fred is not the focal point. If Fred is yeah. a counter. If Fred, like, why was Fred on ball, which he did? He ramped up on ball in the playoffs to the on the way to the championship run because, like, a secondary ball handler who can shoot and also passively spaces the floor adds a wrinkle to the offense that they otherwise didn't have. Why was he alienated? against Philadelphia, right? Why why did that happen? Because Philadelphia with Jimmy Butler and Ben Simmons, and they were able to hide JJ Redick and the guys waiting, they had a defense that put guards in a really tough position. Kyle Lowry, Fred Van Vliet, 
and like even Pascal Siakam, right? They had a defense that did that. The Bucks, yeah. right? The Bucks and the Warriors were less capable of that style of defense. So against the Warriors, Fred comes in and plays these massive minutes with the starting lineup, with these staggered actions, right? And with Serge Ibaka coming in and playing against Philadelphia 76ers, the Raptors go big because that's how you beat that lineup on the other end. And Fred currently is just option one through 27 at the yep. guard position for the Raptors. There's no diversity. It doesn't help him. It doesn't help them. It's tough. That seems fixable, though. Like, you described a situation that if they have an active and successful trade deadline, they can build they... that. Okay, well, how? how? Like, uh, are you trading a first? Are you trading yes. somebody else you would have on the to. team? You would trade a first for a guard for this team. So, the, okay. Now, I'm not saying what you should do yet. Well, But they sure. could. They could viably build live that podcast February seventh. Rivoli, get your tickets. We'll say what, we what save they should happen. Right? Yeah. We'll have a lot more info about what should happen then. Um, but mm-hmm. I, I think it is feasible that they, you know, you said a healthier shooting gear wing like Otto Porter. Okay, that's fine. You can get that. A big, a guard. That's all doable. And yeah. Obviously, that's not um, – you don't want to try to acquire from a position of weakness. But I can first, I can envision this Raptors team building a roster that is less reliant on Fred, able to be successful while keeping him in the fold. That, that's possible. Why, now, my question is, why does all of that sound doable to you? What what does what does the caliber of guard we're looking for cost? What does the caliber of big we're looking for cost? And does if Otto Porter Jr. never finds his toe, what does that caliber of wing cost? Right, because they get one mid level exception, they get one whatever, and if they re-sign Fred, like this team is capped out. This team doesn't want to trade presumably all of their future picks. Like, how do they move to maximize this roster? That's the tough part because the fact is that OG and Anobi on that deal, Pascal Siakam scaling upwards, Fred Van Vliet is going to scale upwards. Like they don't have, because they didn't get that surplus value in years past, they're more squeezed now. That's kind of the thing is like, because Stanley Johnson didn't pan out because Wancho, who I've liked, isn't hitting threes, unfortunately. Like, Wancho has done a bunch of good things on the floor, but he doesn't hit his jumpers, so suddenly he's a lot less viable. If if wh- whoever, like these these 10-day guys, these two-way guys, they don't pan out. Aaron Baines doesn't pan out. Alex Len doesn't pan out. None of these guys stay on the roster, are able... Grievous Vasquez, for example, sign or comes to the roster, right? Gets moved, big surplus value. Because he was good enough with the Raptors that he was desired by other teams. He wasn't just a guy they let go. Slowly, they accumulate things. The Raptors, they have all their picks, but they have a bunch of expensive contracts. They haven't slowly accumulated anything. Nobody wants what the Raptors have to sell on their bench. People want the top end of the Raptors, and that's what we're hearing all the time. So I'm like, that's why I entertain the trade Fred thing is because it's like you have to get cheaper. You have to try and build differently, probably, and you have to do it intelligently, and you have to try and maximize Fred's value at a time where it either could go up this off season based on how he, or next season based on how he plays, or based on the rest of the season, whatever, where it could go down dramatically. Like this is all very hard to juggle. There's always guys that are that that are less expensive than they should be who can really help teams like Kevin Herter Sacramento picked him up and he's one of the best movement shooters in the NBA this year. He's like the handoff King with Sabonis, you know, Jared Allen to Cleveland. The Raptors hit on one of those totally uh, just hold on, hold on. Hear me out here. Yeah. yeah, totally yeah, yeah. I, like, the, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is feasible now, whether it is m- more likely to be able to do that or then to just recoup assets for Fred, which is more feasible for building a winning team down the line. Sure. 
That's why we're talking about trading Fred. You want to rebuild the team? You can trade OG for like, you know, Buddy Heald, Matherin. Like you could, if you really want to talk about building that wealth of, you know, mid-tier assets, the Raptors can do that. And, and I don't think Fred right now would yield a bunch of mid-tier assets for the Raptors. Yeah. So the Raptors reportedly right. They scoff at Malik Monk, for example, who is now, you want to talk about a, a good guard on the Kings, Man. Kevin Herter, of course, Malik Monk. Like the Raptors just haven't, and you talk about Jared Allen, Raptors fans, I don't know if the Raptors at the time were like, because the the, the holdup with Jared Allen was like, well, you don't want to sign him for five years, a hundred million. It's like, why the hell wouldn't you want to sign that guy for five years, a hundred million for what? Yeah. A, a second round pick? What do you end up getting traded for? Right? Like, it's just, yeah. And Kevin Herter, the Raptors haven't gotten into the mix of any of these trades where it's like, yeah, we're moving money around. We're moving players around. There's an interesting guy and he goes out here. The Raptors have just been locked in to trying to get their guys who fit this ideal, who do these things. We'll coach them up. We'll develop them up. We'll do this. And these guys are ending their contracts with the Raptors, not having played meaningful minutes, not getting extended not getting traded elsewhere and that is what has been happening and that is why they're in, that's why they're in the position they're in like like that is that is why we're here yeah. and and malik the thing monk about it oh would make fred look so much better <laughs> malik monk would make everyone look so much better could you imagine that's... like could you imagine yeah we're, we're just like doing fan casting now which yeah, of course is fine i'm sure people listening are saying like yeah hell yeah malik monk but you just imagine Scotty like running these dribble handoff actions with Malik, for example, because Scotty yeah, there's more punch. does Scotty does like a, a fun facsimile. He's a fun facsimile of Demonis Sabonis at times, right? Not as clever, not as slick, but I'm sure he will be someday. It's yeah. just like, yeah, this team is in a very they're not in a bad spot at all. They have Pascal Siakam, a surefire max contract player. Under contract. They have Gary Trent Jr., who still could be traded, re-signed, whatever value. OG Ananobi, who, as many people, talking heads, actually sourced reporters, fans, everybody is like, this guy is worth, you know, a king's ransom. Fred Van Vliet, worth something. Precious Achua, really interesting. But they aren't positioned really well to go for it. That's the problem. And at the start of the season... When it was, okay, Precious is going to provide this floor defensively. Fred is going to be Fred. Um, you know, Scotty ended off the year really strong defensively, like a, like maybe even a marginally positive defender, if not, and if not, then neutral. Pascal Siakam is a, you know, all NBA player, all this kind of stuff. And you expect with so many of those guys being younger, you don't expect the blip. You expect yep. the step. And if not, the step from one from the other, but it's just been uh, a lot of guys not getting anywhere. And then guys who you expected that floor from it falling out. And this means that the, um, when you, when they do studies of what is a really good indicator of wins in the next season, continuity is supposed to be a really, really big indicator for teams. The Raptors had more than almost any, but any team in the NBA and they haven't, even though it is continuity in name, it hasn't been continuity in process. And it hasn't been a continuation of Precious Achua's game, for example. It hasn't truly been a continuation of Fred Van Vliet's game. And so none of their inertia moving forward has been, has been kept that forward version of it. And now it looks like this is a team that is more well-equipped to, um, to change direction than they are to rapidly ascend in the way that they wanted to at the start you know we talked for trading fred we talked trading to help fred uh the raptors just won a very good game is there any chance they just run it back they hold pat could they yeah, if there's... they did that is there any chance they're good <laughs> <sighs> they're because they still have scotty barnes who's scotty barnes is going to continue to get better by the end yeah. of 
this season he's going to be better than he was last season. By the end of next season, he's going to be better than he was at the end of this season, right? Precious Achua, you're probably expecting the same thing. OG Ananobi is probably more or less what we expect of him. Yeah. But there's going to be marginal improvements for him too. Pascal Siakam, who knows if he can get better than this. He he He's struggled in some games with some you know pressure. He's been corralled into certain areas. The jump shot isn't as consistent as it needs to be for him to be just like that top 10 undeniable guy. But he's also a guy who's getting better at running pick and roll and stuff like that. They can have that development work from the inside. But I still don't think running it back is the most sensible option for this team. That's disappointing to say. Yeah. Really, it is. But I'm not sure that it is the most sensible thing for them to do. Sad season. Which is why, you know, so Fred is a lightning rod. And we've talked about some fair and some unfair conversation. But at the end of the day, it seems like where we're pointing is even if it's unfair, a lot of the criticism, he kind of, by virtue of what's happened, uh, is on a different road from the Raptors. Wow, what a diplomatic way to say it, huh? It's it's true. It's that whether it's fair or not, and this is kind of the, this is analysis works the same way, right? There can be somebody who says, they see a player and they say, I like that guy. I love this player because they notice something small and they can bet the farm on this player. Maybe somebody, you know, saw De'Aaron Fox play against Lonzo Ball and, you know, Kentucky versus UCLA, saw him completely beat him up, right? Had a way better game. Doesn't watch any other De'Aaron Fox game, but off of that game says, I see the vision. I'm putting my stock in Fox over Alonzo Ball. And that's correct. De'Aaron Fox is a better player than Alonzo Ball. You would have been correct to do so. He was picked later, and sure, that doesn't mean you understand what was happening at the level of people who went and watched every Fox game and watched every Lamelo game. It's like, you don't have to, in the take economy, you don't have to nail the nuance to be correct. And yeah. everybody who's decided that Fred is bad and needs to be traded, they may be correct about the second half, even though that they're, they're wrong about the first. Damn. Yeah. That sucks. So unfair. A lot of sports is unfair. The Raptors have experienced so much, so little unfairness over the past <laughs> decade. You know, yeah. and I, this is sort of what I wrote about in my piece. It, it almost felt like the Raptors were a team of destiny where – these guys were stepping into the, you know, Fred was stepping into the boots they of were, Kyle. Man. It was it was a team where the narrative weight of what they were building seemed more powerful than anything an opponent could throw at them. <laughs> and for the first time since before Kyle, they're like, nah, man, other teams can be better than even your own fate. And and, and not everything is fair. And the Ra Raptors fans have not experienced a lot of unfairness for a long time. Like, Kawhi shot did not have to go in. Yeah. Maybe they lose in overtime, right? Like, the Raptors... Maybe game three of the Bucks series, they go down 3-0, right? Like, that's double overtime when with Kyle guys fouled out. fouls out. And maybe, you know, Fred doesn't shake the... There's so much. It's like, um, well, it's the... Um, there's, a, there's a theory, there's a theory of the evolution of the universe like the action the superhero the action movie hero where it's like they dodge bullets and the thing and the train and they're saving people and it's like what are the odds of them surviving to the end of the movie let alone the sequel it's like well that's the same odds of life on our on our planet and you know the consciousness of humanity and evolution working out the way it did with our with our with uh, you know the ozone layer and all the things that had to happen um that's almost what the raptors seemed like for so long they were dodging bullets to get where they are and they this season they got hit by the bullets and fred yeah seems like for, for rightly and wrongly he's he is a casualty of of that catching up to yes him. destiny isn't all consuming destiny is destiny mm. here destiny is destiny here fred self like self-fulfilling prophecy bet on himself and whether this contract that he signs is the fattest thing ever or whether he loses money because of this season, whether Pascal Siakam 
is able to drag a Raptors team to respectability, whatever. Their development is their own destiny, wherein the Raptors championship was a part of it. Yeah, This is not all-consuming that because they're part of the Raptors and because they got the four bouncer and because all this stuff happens that this is a team with good vibes and forward momentum and and Masai is the cool, you know, he's the cool owner who makes the good decisions and Bobby's the, you know, cool uh, owner. <laughs> Masai is the the cool president. Vice who makes, yeah, 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 vice chairperson who makes the good, you know, decisions. Bobby is the handsome, cool cap savvy you know gm who makes the good decisions like this stuff all fits together because the raptors are a team of destiny that moves forward look at all the improbable things that are happening look at the way they're able to turn x into y and it's just everything works for this team and we've seen it a million other places raptors fans have laughed about it the directionless zach levine bradley beal whoever right players who built themselves into absolute monsters on the court. They are so damn good. And those guys, despite being so fantastic, the way that Pascal, the way that Fred are, are not destined or owed a team that wins. I'm reading, I already, you already know this. I'm reading um, The Death and Life of Great American Cities by Jane Jacobs. And I think a lot of... Uh, urban design i mean this was written in the 60s so zoning, I, no zoning laws it man is. it's always Sorry. zoning yeah yeah so zoning. a lot of a lot of urban design you know based on that zoning um was was the idea of if you build it they will come right it's it's destiny and the raptor and meanwhile you ignore a lot of the stuff under the hood like if you build a park that's ironic under the hood considering who affected how cities are built that's exactly right I, you know, part one line in her book, she's like, you know, if sidewalks are going to be healthy and safe and kids can play, they need to be 35 feet wide. Meanwhile, I'm looking out the window. I'm like, yeah, 35 feet wide art. Like what? Uh, the, the world has gone a very different direction since 61. But the Raptors have sort of succumbed to this idea of the Garden City, that uh, the radiant Garden City that that Jacobs wrote about, right, where they – we're building towards this utopian vision and it worked for so long that the things that weren't working got swept under the rug. Yes. And yes. there are sacrifices that ha- the bill comes due. And right now the bill's coming due for the Raptors. And so look, it is still possible that destiny overrides this start to the season. Everything you said about the internal development could happen. That Portland sure. game could be the blueprint for the rest of the season. It, you know, you know what? We've seen them win games like that way more over the past two years, three years, than we've seen them lose the games they've lost this season. It's feasible, but man, I don't know. It's it's destiny because it's uh, because they win, and and Pascal Siakam talked about this many times, and he said, "It's I'm paraphrasing, but I promise it's close that." Winning fixes everything, and yeah. it's because it's much harder to find the good in the losing than it is to paper over the bad in the wins. And the Raptors somehow papered over yeah. a finals MVP, leaving their team and getting nothing in return. They got stuff for Chris Bosh, <laughs> right? They yeah. got stuff for Andrea Bargnani. They got stuff for Terrence Davis and Matt Thomas. They did not for Kawhi Leonard. And they didn't just lose Kawhi for nothing. They lost DeMar DeRozan and Jakob Pertl. Like (laughs) the the Kawhi trade, him leaving means you you lose all the stuff you traded for him. Right? It's not just a -a rent-a-championship. It's a -a pay-a-champ. Like, man, the – yeah, it's expensive. And and I I think everybody says – the championship's worth it. <laughs> we we all say the championship's worth it. Yes. Even all of this. And it will continue to be worth it, even if Fred has to be traded. And you know what? Fred could go to a to a team like Denver, for example, and oh my God, like they might he might win another championship for another team this season. Like Fred is still yeah. so good. And even then, the championship would be worth it for Toronto. But it doesn't 
change the um, the difficulty because, like we said, no matter how much we can try for objectivity, we don't have it. And uh, and and this conversation is difficult to see about Fred, and whatever the result is, will also be difficult, you know, f- for us as reporters. I just hope, honestly, to anybody out there who your recent hobby has become talking about Fred in a particularly <laughs> nasty way. I hope that, and I'm not saying you can't, I'm not saying you stop wishing for the team to move in a different direction. You can want him traded. I'm just saying I hope that there's humanity in the way that you operate going forward. And uh, because people are here at the end of this, I guess would be the last thing. The bill comes due not only for the Raptors and the championship, the four bounce or all that kind of stuff, but for treating people terribly. (laughs) You know what, though? People usually realize, usually they realize, you know, when they mistreated someone, they'll, they'll grow up. But there's always another 12-year-old who's going to discover the team, become a fan, <laughs> mistreat the new players down the road. Yeah. Yeah, th- that'll be the case. Um, just hoping for a little humanity from everybody out there. We've talked zoning permits. We've talked the Garden <laughs> City. We've talked a lot of things. Um, we talked about Fred. We talked about the Raptors. We talked about it all. Louis Satzman, is there anything you want to say to people before we get out of here? Um. No, man, this has been an absolute pleasure. Um, I think some criticism from f- fans is fair. I, I mean, I came down hard on criticizing reporters. and play- so, Criticism can be fair, and I think reporters can absolutely act irresponsibly, and criticizing that is fair. It's just the, it's just I, the being nice. Criticizing being nice is crazy to me. But, but uh, uh, you know, I just want – sorry, go ahead. I'll say there are, there are actions by reporters that have been worth of criticism. Oh, exactly right yeah i don't want to paper that over um so you know wanted to perhaps you and i most of all my anti-baby <laughs> stuff is a, is a step too far obviously yo elliot's gonna grow up and punch you right in the mouth and he is tall so uh no what, what it's, percentile I'm, I'm, what percentile he's off the charts baby i said that to someone the other day someone's like how tall is your baby i said the doctor didn't even have a measurement they're like i've never had a parent give me any other answer it hurt <laughs> the bill came due immediately. Yeah. And uh, no, I think this was, uh, we said we were going to cathart. I feel like I catharted. Do you feel, do you feel cathartic? I feel cathartic. That's correct. Then Ooh, the bill good. came due for this very podcast in and in, in a good way. Yeah. It's a, uh, I don't know. Anytime you and I discuss anything, it always becomes abstract. So I hope that the people who, it became more abstract at the back end of the podcast. And I'm assuming <laughs> if you're at the back end, you enjoy the abstract nature, the metaphorical nature with Lewis and I encourage and kind of draw out of each other. So I hope this was enjoyable. And if you aren't listening now and to all the people who just listened to the first half where we lobbed stats and said, Fred hasn't been as bad as people think, but he's still not been as good as the Raptors need him to be and as as good as he wants to be. And I hope that was enjoyable too. But more than anything, I hope that the people listening go to raptorsrepublic.com and subscribe. If you're listening on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. And if you're on the podcast channel, just thanks for uh, listening to us. Millie, thank you for, you know, chiming in every once in a while. You're a, a valued member of the podcast. Lewis, thank you for coming on so much. And uh, yeah, more than anything, thanks everybody for tuning in. Whether you got into this in the morning or at night, and yes, I do still say it, Lewis, have a blessed day and goodbye.